presentation topics include exploring the relevance of statistical knowledge in the workplace, uncovering how statistics can be used across multiple fields, and learning how the Career Services Center can support you in marketing your skills. Let's get some input from you, our audience. If you could just type in um, some responses uh, into the chat area. You know, when I am tutoring statistics students, I frequently get the question, when would I ever need to use this stuff? And I always, I just ask them, so what do you do for a living? You know, and whether it's, you know, if they're a nurse, a teacher, um, a business person, um, it, I can't think of a field that actually doesn't use statistics. So we, we are getting some responses. Infection prevention, I'm seeing uh, reading and providing explanation, reading reports and providing explanations. Seems like we have a lot of healthcare folks here, healthcare quality, healthcare administration, uh, nursing. Right. You know, I'll ask a nurse that, I'll say, so you have best practices. So where did those best practices come from? You know, and typically it's from research and the research was supported by uh, statistical analysis showing that whatever it is, you know, hand washing or, you know, using sanitary, we have psychology, human services. So I think we're making the way teaching, um, marketing, you know, and frankly, even for all of us who are or recently were students, I mean, even our grades, it's a form of mm -hmm. data and, you know, data analysis, our grade point averages, all of those things. So I think, yep, financial advising, juvenile justice. So I think we're we're making our point, we're hitting all of these areas. Thank you, Denise. And I am honored to welcome Sharon Roberts. She is a PhD management leadership and organizational change student at Walden. She earned her MBA from University of Canada West, and she is a project manager at University Health Network, Toronto General Hospital in Toronto, Canada. Sharon's vast experience spans over 25 years as a project manager, IMIT consultant, organizational consultant, and healthcare change agent. She's also a trainer, presenter, and respected author. Welcome to the program, Sharon. Hi, Dina. Hi, everyone. Hi, Sharon. Could you share with us how you've uh, used your knowledge of statistics to improve patient care at the University Health Network where you are employed? Well, um, I'm sure many of our participants in healthcare know that we, in healthcare itself, there's constant pressure to reduce costs and improve patient care. And University Health Network is no exception. One of the areas that I worked on last year comes to mind, and it is in the ambulatory care area with outpatient clinics. And my story goes like this. Several uh, clinics had requested more space because of increasing clinic volumes. And the funny thing is that when we visited the clinic areas, we couldn't justify the additional space because there was not much going on. So we used the data to tell our story. We collected data on the physician schedule. We collected data on patient experience. We also collected data on how resources were being used. And we presented that data to the clinical teams, especially the physician groups, and it was a surprise to find out most of patients were being seen between the hours of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., Tuesdays to Thursdays, and very little activity on Mondays and Fridays. And when that uh, data was presented, I used Excel, um, the statistical tools portion of it, the data analysis, and did some functions and validation, averages, percentages, and variances, and did, did also the what ifs. And I presented that data, and it was an eye opener, not only for the clinical groups, but the organization. And I was able to show that our utilization in outpatient clinic area was 50%. So there was no need to increase space. 
the problem was how we were using the space. And so with my statistical and data analysis knowledge, I was able to present the data so that people could understand and share that information. And in so doing, I, I was able to get the buy-in from the clinical teams to come up with solutions to, to better utilize the space. And um, without having that statistical knowledge and the business knowledge, I think those two, marrying those two, helped to present a very good picture. Now we can predict when patients are coming in because we can adjust schedules and we can also do time trend analysis to ensure that we're utilizing the space much better than we're doing now. So I think over the last couple of months, now that we have made some adjustments, we're, we're maximizing the use of space and also improving the patient experience. Sharon, how were you able to use mixed methods to gain a deeper understanding of your organization? Uh, another story comes to mind, and this is about uh, patient experience itself. Um, we've been using a third party external provider to tell us what our patient satisfaction scores are like but unfortunately that information is historical meaning that patients fill out the information at least three months after their visit so we're not really getting real-time data so um what we did was create a cross-sectional team across the organization, we got together and we devised patient uh, surveys and healthcare team surveys to tell us what's going on in the organization in real time. And we gathered the information over a course of a year and we found out from the healthcare team their stories. Not only their scores were a third of what the patients told us, but their story was that if we take care of them, then they will take better care of the patients. And what the story was is that they said they were more interested in respect and relationships than anything else. And so we devised a plan to address that. And we have seen tremendous results, better staff relationships, better interactions with each other and that's translated to better relationships with the patients and we're seeing uh, in the the way culture the culture is evolving in the organization as a result of sharing the information and um, also analyzing the information with cross-sectional teams and coming up with solutions to help improve our scores Thank you, Sharon, uh, for sharing these wonderful stories of how you use statistics to really tell your story and make an impact. And, now, and Dr. Zinn received his PhD in public health with a specialization in epidemiology from Walden in 2014. He currently works as Walden's Academic Skills Center, um, in the Skills Center as an instructional support specialist. He holds an MBA in healthcare management and an undergraduate degree in clinical science cytotechnology. He is currently the supervisor and operations manager of an anatomic pathology laboratory, a hazmat safety officer, and a part-time lecturer at California State University. So multiple roles, very impressive roles. And welcome, Dr. Zinn, to the program. Oh, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Dr. Zinn, you currently hold multiple roles as a public health educator, researcher, laboratory supervisor, safety officer, and university lecturer. Could you share how your knowledge of statistics impacts these roles? Well, certainly. Uh, just as many students, I took statistics as an undergrad, MBA student and PhD in public health student at Walden. And as many students, uh, statistics did not click with me at first. Only after becoming a peer mentor of advanced biostatistics, it started to all make sense to me. 
Uh, today, statistics applies to almost all aspects of my professional life, whether I'm wearing the hat of a researcher, supervisor, safety officer, or higher education instructor. Statistics um, makes my job easier and makes me better. Uh, as a cancer researcher and specialist, I work with surgeons to diagnose patient tumors suspicious of being cancerous. Uh, most of these are first-time diagnoses of cancer. I use microscopy, tumor profiles, clinical trials, uh, research on pharmacology, immunohistochemistry, and genetic analysis as a few tools to determine the molecular profiles of tumors. Uh, knowing the molecular profile of a tumor, the oncologist can provide the best chemotherapy options for individual patients. Uh, this process is known as companion diagnostics. Biopsy procedures procure very little tissue, often only a few drops of blood or fluid. My knowledge of statistics helps me make the companion diagnostics diagnosis from that little tissue that is collected. Without uh, statistics, we would not be able to make uh, accurate companion diagnostic diagnoses, and cancer treatment would be more general and less specific as we had uh, 30 or so years ago. Without statistics, there would not have been improvements in cancer treatments. Um, most of what I have just described is, is done in the medical professional world. More common to people is cancer staging and survival. It's easy to assume that each of us has known someone diagnosed with cancer, and a common question is, how long do they have to live? Um, many cancers are staged based on spread to lymph nodes and proximal and distal organs. Depending on the cancer type and the staging of the cancer, the gender of the patient, the age of the patient, and the ethnicity of the patient, the survival of the patient can be estimated. Um, this is an application of survival curve analysis, a statistical test. Even though many people may not understand how to calculate the survival curve test statistic, the interpretation of the data, in this case cancer uh, survival, has probably touched everyone in uh, one way or another. At the Los Robles Hospital and Medical Center, I also supervise 14 direct reports. I use statistical concepts such as the mean, mode, median, and variance to determine productivity versus staffing hours. I perform correlations for trends and make projections for staffing needs, ensuring that patient care is provided consistently throughout the healthcare system without budget. Great, thank you, Dr. Zinn. And also, you are a hazmat safety officer at the hospital. How does statistics impact your role? As the hazmat safety officer for our hospital system, we have uh, three separate campuses. I'm responsible for complying with the Joint Commission standards as they pertain to management of hazardous materials within the hospital system. The hospital material standards are a subset of the environment of care section, of the Joint Commission accreditation process. These standards are safety rules required for the accreditation by the Joint Commission. Several of the qualifying standards are statistics-based. Um, what are the trends, improvements? What is the percentage of drills versus spills? Is there a reduction in the number of spills? Is there a change in the production of hazardous materials waste? I use regression analysis and descriptive statistics to answer these questions meeting accreditation standards. In what ways has your knowledge of statistics impacted your ability to provide quality instruction? As a lecturer at the California State University Channel Islands, I teach multiple courses in hematology, immunology, epidemiology, and other topics. Uh, my students range from freshman to graduate. Statistics allows me to enhance all of the courses I teach. The literature is packed with statistics. All students from undergrad to the graduate level need to present published data. Many times, uh, students do not actually know what they're presenting. Um, I help them understand what the numbers really mean. I challenge them with questions such as, is this the best statistical test for this research? What kinds of tests would be better? I make them consider the different statistical ways a research question can be answered. Um, my ability to understand statistics and convey statistical concepts to students helps me excel as an educator. And our panelists have shared their experience on how statistics is used across multiple fields.
Now we'd like to open it up for questions from our audience. As they're coming in, I do have a question, you know, maybe for all of the panelists. You know, the, all of you are really accomplished people. You're, you know, you, you do wonderful things, but we've also kind of sent the message that, that stats are pervasive throughout, you know, all of our work lives and across many, if not all, professions. With that being the case, why do people find stats so difficult to grasp? I know, Dr. Tway, you even mentioned that you s struggled with statistics. And, you know, I, I found the same thing. So if stats are so pervasive, why, why is it so stressful for us to get our heads around stats? Well, Dr. Dunn, I, I'd say that stats, it's hard for us to get our, our heads around stats because stats has its own language. Yeah. And until you get an understanding of that language of stats, it's the the concepts um, are are fuzzy. Um, one of the difficult challenges is just understanding the difference between a sample and a population. Those two are always related. Mm -hmm. But when you run a statistical test, the sample gives you a number, but for the population, you get a range. And Students sometimes, it, it took me a number of years to figure that out, but once I understood that for the population I have a range and for my sample I have a number, everything started to make sense at that point. Yep. Awesome. I have another question coming in. Um, do you feel that it was a benefit to attend Walden in order to get a better position in the work environment? And maybe even a related question to that, to kind of couple on that, you know, we all take statistics courses. So how how well did the statistics courses that we took and the coursework we 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 completed at Walden, how did that prepare you as panelists for the amazing careers that you've all had? Well, you know, Dr. Dunn, I I, uh, I can speak to that as well. I would say that uh, I took at Walden University, I actually had six separate statistical courses and very thorough, um, very complete, um, very extensive as well. Um, and it, they prepared me very well for for all aspects of, of uh, statistical processing um, outside of, of uh, the education. Um, I highly recommend that students take beyond the minimum requirement of statistics for the courses that or the, uh, the program that that they're enrolled in. Um, some programs only have one or two courses. I strongly suggest that students take more than just the one or two um, so they get a, a better grasp because as they move forward in their professional careers, the statistics, as, we, as you said, pervasive, it doesn't go away. It just becomes more and more and you really should have a much, much better understanding of statistics if you wish to succeed in your career. Any of the other panelists, any comments on that question specifically? Hi, Patrick, this is Sharon. Um, to add to what Dr. Uh -huh. Vin said, I, I, I would think that, uh, you know, sometimes you could write pages and pages of information and it gets stuck because nobody has the time to read more than one page at a time, even a sentence. And a picture is a thousand words. If you can show your what you're saying in a chart, that will that will make a world of difference. And this is what I did with the um, outpatient clinic data. I showed the histograms. I showed the tables, and that's what jumped out at people, seeing the variation between what the current state is and what we would do when we were to make a change in the future state. And they could actually agree that the current state was representing what was happening. It was real and they could identify. And, and that to me made a big difference than writing pages and pages of, of information that nobody was gonna understand. Any other comments from the panel? I did have another uh, question coming in. Um, a couple of questions regarding statistical tools and, you know, 
This could include software tools like Excel, SPSS, uh, possibly even a, a, you know, a statistical calculator. Uh, but what, what type of software or other tools do you all use in your work? Answer this, Patrick. Um, I, I, although I use SPSS in my courses, I find in the workplace Excel does a wonderful job because uh, it's a Microsoft Office tool that everybody has on their desktop mm -hmm. and it's easy to share. And plus, um, with few instructions, you can even do pivot tables and present that to a multitude of people and they get it instead of something that is very academic. So Excel is a great tool in the workplace. I would agree. And you know, I found that using Excel and SPSS are not mutually exclusive. It's actually fairly easy to go back and forth. You can have a data set in Excel. You can save it um, in, and actually run your stats in SPSS. Another question coming in is, you know, I mean, one of the big hot buttons now is around what we call big data. So big data to me implies big statistics. So how has the, um, the statistical field, and I guess the tools and resources that we all use in stats, uh, adapting to this emerging science of big data. Hi, Patrick. It's Sharon again. Um, uh -huh. I know in healthcare, big data is like the buzzword right now. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and it's, it's applied to any industry. You can almost measure anything, any variable, anything that you want to question. Um, for, for example, you use the, uh, the hand hygiene analogy. Um, Collecting data, how many times somebody washes or don't washes their hands is big in healthcare. And we're able to show that just by observation and counting the number of times somebody goes in a room, washes hands, comes out of the room and so forth. And pulling all that data across the continuum of, of a patient's care, across an organization, pulling all that data together tells the story of how well we're doing. Um, so that's just one aspect of it. The Ministry of Health here in Canada, they we have to report on that information. So that becomes part of a bigger set of data of what's happening across Canada. How well is healthcare teams washing their hands? And we're uh -huh. able to tell a story about that. So it has it has a local impact as well as a global impact. And in, in my specific, oh, Zin, go ahead. Oh, yeah, uh, Dr. Dunn, thank you. I just wanted to add to um, what Sharon was saying that uh, recently, it was actually um, earlier this week, that I'm now going to be working with a group. Um, they're a nationwide group actually collecting data on patients who survive and do not survive um, the field, uh, oh, she's when they actually, the emergency medical technicians uh, provide the, um, I'm forgetting the term right now, for charging the heart once their heart okay. stops. Defibrillation. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. And so what this team has been collecting is they have I think it's 460 different independent variables that they're collecting from the patient's medical chart and also including genetic information to try to make determinations of who's going to survive defibrillation and who is not. Um, and their data set in so far, I believe they have over 6,000 participants multiplied by the 460 plus independent variables. So that's a really large data set. And from that, they're making that data set um, available to researchers who have very specific uh, research questions to answer. Um, once this study is complete and the data set is complete, I believe that we're really going to see some improvement in terms of survivability in the field. You know, just a comment in, in my specific field, I deal a lot with digital tools, also in healthcare. So it's amazing what, you know, smartphone technology, tablets, 
the you know you know wireless technology i mean the data you know if you have the you know the apple health you know the google health you name it health you know it's amazing the amount of data that can be collected your physical activity i mean i wake up in the morning and i have a device that tells me how many hours i was asleep so i think a big challenge for at least in my field and i would guess in many of yours is with big data we have so much data available to us is to try to figure out you know where we even start you know what what data do we focus on because if you focus on all of it you know you may you may miss some of those big big questions so thank you so much for joining us here today we would also like to extend a big to Patrick Dunn for moderating today's program and also to our amazing panelists, Sharon Roberts, Stephen Mears, and Dr. Zin Sway, who have shared their experiences and insights with all of us.